you are welcome to my channel thanks for visiting subscribing listening to all my presentations and sharing today the main topic is malaria and i'll be going through everything that we should know about malaria this is the battle against an insect and the insect is mosquito not all mosquitoes but female anopheles mosquito when it comes to the epidemiology of malaria you can find a full presentation on that going through this link so if you click on this link that will take you to a full presentation on epidemiology of malaria here on my channel Malaria is found in close to 90 countries. Greater than 90% of the total cases are found in Africa. Less than 10% in Southeast Asia, plus Eastern Mediterranean regions. Less than 1% is found in Western Pacific and America. Still on epidemiologists, tourists do take the disease from one region to the other. For example, from Africa or Southeast Asia to Europe and North America. The hepatic schisms can remain for many months and the affected persons can become sick in the new region. For example, someone has just traveled from India or Sub Saharan Africa to Europe or North America. If the hepatitis chrysum has not been eradicated with the help of Prima Queen, there could be relapse in the new country, though without female Anopheles mosquito. Persistency may be difficult because the absence of the female Anopheles mosquito will end the transmission to other people, but the person with no erythrocytic stage that has been treated by the party stage has not been cleared off can actually develop malaria within months or even up to one or two years in the new country even without female anopheles mosquitoes you will get a clearer picture as we move on from world health organization the record has revealed that more than 200 million cases occurred each year between 2010 to 2019. More than 430,000 people died due to malaria in 2016. But there was a drop in mortality to 400,000 from 430,000 in 2016 in 2019. Let me repeat. In 2016, 430,000 people you know, died, or 430,000 deaths in 2016. That dropped to 400,000 in 2019. Transmission. Transmission of the plasmodium can occur through bites from mosquitoes. Don't worry, we we'll soon get to the life cycle. We'll understand that. And there could be vertical transmission, otherwise known as congenital transmission from mother to the fetus in pregnancy. True blood transmission that is not properly screened or sharing of needles or organ transplantation. For example, someone needs no liver transplantation, but unfortunately, the liver available happen to be the type that has hepatitis chrysum. Well, that will grow, multiply, and then erythrocytic stage will set in with signs and symptoms of malaria. Also could be acquired through the hospital environment, nosocomia transmission. Plasmodium types. When the story is about malaria, there's no way that will not keep mentioning female anovelis mosquito and of course plasmodium. Now the plasmodium, we have six of them 
as plasmodium falciparum, the worst of them all. Plasmodium vivas, plasmodium malaria, plasmodium nova, plasmodium nullis, plasmodium simi. If you want further information on epidemiology, please kindly click on this very link. Now, malaria control. There is a full presentation on malaria control already published by me. You can get that through this very link. We will be able to address malaria control properly if we take into account the factor that this female anovelis mosquito and we'll go through the life cycle and how we can control the vector using each stage of the life cycle that will metamorphose to the other. Then we'll go through the plasmodium life cycle also. There we will understand that we have a party schizont known as perierythrocytic stage. And we will also understand that we will not have signs and symptoms at this stage. We will also know later on that erythrocytic stage will give us signs and symptoms of malaria. When it comes to malaria control, it is a joint effort. World Health Organization Global Technical Strategy for Malaria now, as indicated that from 2016 to 2030, the focus will be on malaria control. So it is ongoing. We cannot have malaria control without having surveillance. So we will either have active surveillance, that is house to house detection of malaria. I think that would be pretty difficult, but we can have passive surveillance at its hospital record of malaria cases. That will give us you know, the insight to the degree of endemicity. Now, we can control malaria through all these means. It's either we embark on prophylactic anti-malaria, particularly those traveling from non-endemic zones like Europe or North America, moving down to endemic zones like Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia. Effective malaria drugs to those who are sick when they are properly treated, even when bitten by female and novelis mosquito, the, the mosquitoes will not be able to ingest you no know, the gametocytes from them. Protection from mosquito bites. When you are protected, the mosquito could not even bite you at all particularly female and novelist mosquito, then they will not be able to inject the you know, sporozoids into you. Also, the mosquito that is vector control, in fact, that should be the main target. And vaccines, since 1960, it has been back and forth on the production of effective vaccine against malaria. The journey so far, the record is right here. Just keep listening. And the new development right now is genetic control. We'll go through all this in a bit. Or if you skip and you just click on the link provided for malaria control, I have explained in details each of these subjects. Yeah, the goal is to reduce or eradicate mosquitoes. To be effective, we have to check the life cycle of mosquitoes here. And that will start from X to love, to pupa, and to adult. Female anovelis mosquito will lay hundreds of cigar shaped eggs per cycle. That is significant. You could see the, t the type of shape of the eggs, right? That will give clue that what we are dealing with will be female anovelis mosquitoes. Anopheles will lay eggs in clean water, like in rare puddles, water tanks, and irrigation sites. So you know when not to keep water for a long time in all these areas. If you want to get rid of the female Anopheles mosquito using the habitat control, we can embark on empty stagnant water. So you just when you see stagnant water, just you know, pour it away. Clear the bushes around you. 
Replace other story times periodically. Pick away any container that can retain water around your door. The lava or female Anopheles mosquito will lie horizontally on the water and no siphon. So if that is what you've seen, then you are dealing with the one who could carry plasmodium later on. Larvicides cannot kill lava, but surface oil can kill lava by suffocation. And the environmentalists will ask, so are you going to be pouring oil on the surface of water you see? Mm -hmm. Drain pockets of water, please. So you don't need to be pouring oil everywhere. Just drain the pocket of water you can see. Clear the bush. Create fluctuation in reservoir water levels. Okay? Certain species of fish like Gambusia and Poseilia can feed on larvae in the ponds. So why not rearing the swans around you? Now the pooper stage. The pupa stage will float on water surface with a cephalothorax, meaning the head and thorax are fused together. It can breathe, but it cannot fade. Eradication of the pupa can be through pyriprosifen. That is a medication that has the ab ability to regulate the insect growth. Very useful in water-filled pits. It prevents the metamorphosis from larva to pupa and from pupa to adult. Biological control using Bacillus ringensis israelensis is also no, a possibility. Now, the adult female Anovalis mosquito. Metamorphosis from pupa to adult will occur in about two days. Female and male will feed on nectar, but the female will need blood for eggs production, and so they feed on animals. Some will say, okay, then how do they transmit the plasmodium to us, human beings? In biology, human beings are also animals, right? They are animals. At age of three, blood sucking will start. Now, how do we control these adults? You can have indoor residual spraying, you know, DDT, that is organochlorine, malatoin, organophosphate, carbamate, pyrethroids, laser house laws. Yeah, this is pretty uh, interesting. You can lower the mosquitoes and then use insecticides to kill them. Still on control, a good acute case treatment will prevent more transmission. Let me pause here and explain further. When you handle the erythrocytic stage using your testonate, you no know, intravenously, then switching over to a testonate combination therapy, as the case may be, and then you are leaving the Hepatitis chizons, particularly Plasmodium oval and vivas, alone, without using primaquine to clear them, then we are not ending that transmission because there will be multiplication later on and growth, and then it will become erythrocytic stage later on, you know, and another insect will bite and feed and ingest the chemicides, and the life cycle will continue in the insect. Medications that can clear the erythrocytes chizons will be good, mm -hmm. followed by those that can eradicate the hepatitis chizon. I think we got it now. It is good to clear the erythrocytes chizon. The patient will be out of signs and symptoms, but the hepatitis chizon should be cleared, including the merozoids and gametocytes. The life cycle in mosquito that bites will never occur again. If we can clear the hepatitis chizons, the gametocytes, the merozoids, and erythrocytic chizons. So, since when they buy, they can't get anything, they can't get the gametocytes, so the stages in mosquitoes will be cut off and they will not be able to transmit you know, more sporozoids to human beings.
You can follow this link if you want to have details on malaria control. Malaria vaccine. When it comes to malaria vaccine, full info is right here. Please follow this link or click on this very uh, link. That will take you to my channel where I have full presentation on malaria vaccine. But I will not leave you without some pieces of info right now. So some will say that there's no malaria vaccine. Are they right? If you say they are right, mm-hmm. If you say they are wrong, mm-hmm. The only approved one as of today is RTSS. Then the brand name is Mosquiris. Lusitana in Malawi, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that properly, in April 2019, became the first child in the world to receive malaria vaccine. Malaria vaccine uh, is such a program that has been off and on since the 1960s. But today, we can give credit to whom it is due, right? Therefore, we should give credit to what I read Army Institute of Research, who began the good job in 1984. Later on, they teamed up with a big pharmaceutical company, Glasgow Smith Clean. And in 1987, the vaccine became now a positive one. Later on, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation with the help of Pad Malaria Vaccine Initiative, you no, know, led to what we are about to talk about today. So it's joint effort that began with the Army Institute, you know, Water Reed Army Institute, Glasgow Smith Clean came in, and in 1987, something tangible started. Belinda and Melinda Gates gave them the morning with an additional, you no, know, with help from part malaria vaccine initiative. Malaria vaccine from Glasgow Smith Clean. This contains RTSS, plasmodium falciparum cyclosporozoic protein fuse, or combined with hepatitis B of its antigen. It is also known as plasmodium falciparum and hepatitis B vaccine. It is meant for active immunization. Don't worry about this spelling. One is for British English and the other one is American English. So it's for active immunization of children from ages six weeks to 17 months. Now let's go through the age group that could take malaria vaccine. Not routinely used in babies, particularly babies between six to 12 weeks. No, we're not giving it. The first dose should be given at least by the age of five months. Okay? So the child must have you know, grown more than five months. So the second dose should be one month after the first dose. And the third dose should be one month after the second dose, while the fourth dose should be 15 to 18 months after the third dose. On October 25, 2015, SAGE and MPAC made a joint recommendation to World Health Organization. They are both you know, in World Health Organization. Who then recommended RTS use in January 2016 for pilot introduction in three countries? The three countries were selected in 2019 by World Health Organization. You could see what the organization moved pretty fast on this matter, right? They got recommendation from two of their own bodies. Then in 2016, January, that just three months after already, uh, they thought of introducing you no know, pilot program in three countries. And in 2019, three years later, I mean, after writing to some countries, you know, telling them they should do this and do that and back and forth, it concluded in 2019 by selecting three countries 
no for the pilot program. The countries selected are Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi. The pilot program will continue until 2023, meaning as you are listening to this presentation today, in July 2021, the pilot program is underway, is ongoing. Okay, who chose Africa for the pilot program and why that? Because the Africans bear the most burden of malaria. Malaria vaccine was incorporated into the routine childhood vaccines in those latter countries. They are not done yet. Research is still ongoing. For example, there's another one, R21 Strat Matrix M, that is even assumed to be better than most queries. What other organization is directly supervising or overseeing the entire process? Kudos to them. Lusitana from Malawi became the first child in the world to receive malaria vaccine in April 2019. Thousands of children have received it, meaning the journey started from here, but the journey has not ended. The rest countries are waiting for the final report from World Health Organization. Hopefully, it will become available and then many more countries, from India to all other countries in Southeast Asia, will also benefit, even other countries in Africa, all countries battling with endemicity of malaria will be able to have malaria vaccine not long from now. But if you want to have more pieces of info on malaria vaccine, please kindly click on this very link and you will have a full presentation from me on malaria vaccine. Plasmonium life cycle. Please kindly click on this very link for full info on plasmodium life cycle. I have a full presentation published right here through this link, but I will not leave you without some pieces of info right now. Why do we have to study the life cycle of the plasmodium? We should know that mosquitoes and human beings are both involved in this life cycle. The infection you know, is at erythrocytic stage, meaning Signs and symptoms of malaria will manifest at the erythrocytic stage of the plasmodium in humans. A party stage is responsible for relapse if it is not eradicated. Anti-malaria agent selection is based on the life cycle of the plasmodium. Effective malaria control will be enhanced when we know fully the life cycle of plasmodium. For example, we know that we should bother ourselves about mosquitoes, but not all mosquitoes. We should bother ourselves about Anopheles mosquitoes, not all Anopheles mosquitoes, but female Anopheles mosquitoes. And we know some stages will occur in the mosquitoes, and some stages will occur in human. Even in human, we know the erythrocytic stage is right there where we're going to have signs and symptoms of malaria. And we also know that the party stage is right there where signs and symptoms will not be there. But after some months, there could be signs and symptoms of malaria because multiplication and growth will occur. And then, you know, we run into a erythrocytic stage again. I'll start with the definition of certain times here. Yeah. Plasmodium, that is a unicellular obligate parasite of insects and vertebrates. Here, the insects will be mosquitoes, particularly female and nopheles mosquito when it comes to malaria. And the vertebrates here will be animals on the field and human beings. The plasmodium would develop in insects, and that will be insects that will feed on the blood and then inject the plasmodium into the vertebrates. Inside the vertebrates, there will be further growth and multiplication, and that will occur in the liver. Don't worry, in a bit, you'll get a clearer picture. 
After that, they will then invade the red blood cells in the bloodstream. You can see the image here. And that will lead to destruction of the cells and the release of certain chemicals, cytokines and pro-inflammatory cells and so on. And then the individual will come down with signs and symptoms of malaria. Another insect will then bite the sick person, will pick up some parasites from the sick person and start a new cycle all over. Further definition will include sporozoids because we will come across that. And that means a spore like stage of the plasmodium life cycle. It is motor and it is the infective agent that will be introduced into the vertebrates, or let me say, into humans. You will come across schizons. A schizon is a cell that divides by schizogony to form daughter cells. You will also see trovozoids. That is a growing stage that absorbs nutrients from the host. The list will include merozoid. That is a trovozoid from schizogony with the capability to initiate both the sexual and asexual developmental cycles. Furthermore, on definition, we will come across gametocyte. I will not go into full biological definition of that, just limiting it to plasmodium right here for today. That would be sexual precursor cells of the plasmodium. Here we will come across the male gametocytes, which will be defined as micro gametocytes, and the female gametocytes, which will be described as macro gametocytes. We will also come across zygote, but I will not go into full biological definition of that, just limiting it to this today that it is fertilized egg cell from the union of the male and female gametocytes. Oaknet is a motor zygote or plasmodium that forms the oocyst. Why the oocyst is a thick wall structure containing a zygote or plasmodium and capable of releasing infective sporozoids. Now, plasmodium types. Some will be surprised because many people will be familiar with plasmodium falciparum, right? We have more than that, where we actually have six. But you will get the full picture about the geographical location of each of these when you listen to the presentation I've already published on the epidemiology of malaria. There you will see you know, the regions of the world where you can find each of these. But for now, the types of plasmodium will be plasmodium falciparum, plasmodium vivas, plasmodium malaria, plasmodium noval, plasmodium nolesi, and plasmodium simium. These will not be found in all regions of the world. You are going to find plasmodium simium in some regions, fevers in another, falciparum is you know, the one with the broader location, but check my presentation on epidemiology of malaria. Okay, back to the life cycle of plasmodium. We'll be dealing with two stages. Stages in human being and in the mosquito. Human stages. Here, the female anovelis mosquito with plasmodium during a blood meal will bite a malaria-free person, and the journey starts from there. Okay, here I've decided to make a sketch of my own. So mosquito bites human being, okay? It's human skin, right? Pretty funny. Then what will happen? Sporozoids will be injected into the blood of that person, and then straight into the liver, where it will form hepatic schizons. The 
a party's schisms will undergo growth and multiplication. And then merozoids will be released. Okay? The merozoids released will be released into the circulatory system. And this stage is called the pre-erythrocytic stage or the hepatic stage. So when the merozoids are released, they will attack the red blood cells. But two things will likely happen here. A, part of it will form the female macrogametocytes and male microgametocytes. Okay? Then part will undergo ring formation. And then there will be early trophozoid formation, which mean trophozoid phase will then begin. Then erythrocytic schizons will be formed. And that will be you know, the case that will eventually release myrosoids later, rupturing from the red blood cells. So this is the erythrocytic stage. So there are two stages in human being, the pre-erythrocytic stage in the liver and the erythrocytic stage in the red blood cells. The erythrocytic stage is the time that cytokines and pro-inflammatory cells will be released and the individual will have signs and symptoms of malaria. So the male macro gametocytes and the uh, female macro gametocytes will be picked up when there's another mosquito binds this sick person uh, in the cycle. The mosquito stitch. You can see the mosquito, right? And the very specific one will be the female Anopheles mosquito. Sporogony cycle, that is multiplication in the mosquito, will begin. So, sporogony cycle, that is multiplication in the mosquito, will begin during the blood meal. The female Anopheles mosquito will take in the merozoids, that is the, uh, the sexual part, I mean the sexual form, male and female gametocytes will be ingested while feeding on the sick person who had already gotten the merozoids in the system. So in mosquito, what's going to happen? Um, let's start from here. So when the sick person is being bitten by mosquito, while feeding on human beings already sick with uh, malaria plasmodium, they will ingest the male and female gametocytes. Okay? The male gametocytes, the female gametocytes, then something will happen. There will be penetration of the female gametocyte by the male gametocyte, forming zygote. Okay? So, the zygote will then develop to ukinate. Then from ukinate, the ukinate will invade the mid-gut wall to form the oocyst. So you can see the mid-gut, that is where this will take place. And then the mid-gut wall, that is where the oocyst will be formed. Then later, sporozoids will be released from the oocyst. And then the sporozoids will migrate to the salivary gland of the mosquito. Okay? Then, mosquito that will further go ahead to bite another human being will then inject. You could see the two terms ingest, that is taken in from the sick person, they will take in the microgametocytes and the microgametocyte forming zygote, ukinate, and so on. This time, the sporozoid in salivary gland will be injected into the human being. Then, the human stage 
will start when the mosquito stage has ended. So the cycle begins all over. Finally, on the mosquito stage of the plasmodium life cycle, once the salivary gland is reached, the sporozoids can easily be inoculated or injected into the blood of the next human victim. I'm limiting you know, this to between female anovelis mosquito and human being, because that is my focus. And the human cycle starts right now with that. So if you want to have you no know, broader knowledge as per the plasmodium life cycle, please kindly click on this very link. There is another full presentation on plasmodium life cycle alone. I don't want to weary you, you know, having just one lecture to handle malaria from A to Z will be pretty long. That's why I've decided to cut it into sections and have separate full presentation on each. So please go to this link for further information on plasmodium life cycle. Types of fever in malaria. We've just gone through the life cycle of plasmodium. And with that, we've been able to see that we have erythrocytic and hepatic stages. The fever and malaria will only manifest during erythrocytic stage. In case you skip the plasmodium life cycle and you want to have a, you know, a look at full info on that, you can click on this very link. The hepatic stage has no symptoms, no signs. Erythrocytic stage with a cyclic lysis of red blood cells as trobosoid completes its life cycle that will lead to signs and symptoms manifesting as fever and so on. If the life cycle is completed every alternate days, that is every second day, then we have tertiary fever. If the life cycle is completed or we have mind fever that will reoccur at every three to four days. For example, fever on Monday, then on Thursday, then on Sunday, we can say that we're dealing with quartan fever. Now, the quartan fever. This is mind, and it will reoccur at every three to four days. For example, Fever on Monday, then on Thursday, then on Sunday. Quite a fever is found in Plasmodium malaria. Benign tertiary fever. This is the case where fever occurs at alternate days. For example, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It is benign when it is non fatal as it is found in Plasmodium vivas and Plasmodium ova. The benign Titan fever is the most common type. Glad to know, right? Now, the malignant Titan fever. The fever occurs at alternate days like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. When the word malignant is written, it means that it could be fatal. It's very dangerous, difficult to treat, as a, as a matter of fact, multidrug resistance is found here. The malignant tertian fever is found in Plasmodium falciparum. It is the most deadly or the most life-threatening form of malaria. So anytime Plasmodium falciparum is picked on peripheral blood smear, we know we have something serious to deal with. Severe malaria. By way of definition, severe malaria means we have done the peripheral blood smear testing and it's showing parasitemia, and specifically we pick plasmodium falciparum, which is the main agent that will give us severe malaria. But that is just the first thing to do because without peripheral blood smear showing 
Now, plasmodium, we cannot say this is malaria. Okay, now there's malaria, but is it severe or not? We will know if, in addition to this, we are able to pick one or more of the following. So, peripheral blood smear showing plasmodium falciparum. In addition, there is cerebral malaria. That's enough to say severe malaria is what we are dealing with. Or there is hypoglycemia, not caused by any other you know, factor of factors. Then we can say this is severe malaria. Peripheral blood smear, plasmodium falciparum, impaired consciousness, not due to any other reasons other than this malaria, it is severe malaria. So, hypotension that could not be traceable to any other reasons besides malaria, then it is severe malaria. Okay, let's move fast. Peripheral blood smear showing plasmodium falciparum with severe anemia or pulmonary edema or shock or multiple organ failure is severe malaria. Or associated with jaundice, prostration, convulsions, Metabolic acidosis, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, those will be clinical features suggestive of severe malaria. Bleeding, hematemesis, melena, renal impairment, or tachypnea, pointing to severe malaria. Treatment of severe malaria. For you to go through A to Z of what to do when you are faced with severe malaria, Please, you can click on this very link and that will help greatly. Now, for selection of appropriate anti malaria drugs to handle severe malaria, please kindly go through this very link. There, I have you know, stated one by one what we can do in the face of severe malaria. Now, cerebral malaria. World Health Organization definition of cerebral malaria is that it is a clinical syndrome characterized by coma for at least one hour post seizures or after apoglycemia has been adequately treated and is also associated with essential forms of plasmodium falciparum on peripheral blood smears. Here on cerebral malaria, it is the most severe neural complication of plasmodium falciparum, affecting children the most, but that is not the case in some regions of the world, like Southeast Asia, is affecting adults more than children. Mortality is pretty high. Epidemiology of cerebral malaria. It is more in tropical countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. There, in Sub-Saharan Africa, children under 15 are mostly affected. But when it comes to Southeast Asia, adults are mostly affected. Hundreds of millions of malaria cases are reported yearly. Just 1% of all malaria will be severe malaria. Cerebral malaria is the worst neural problem associated with severe malaria. Pathophysiology and pathogenesis of cerebral malaria is such that mostly we don't know. But there is an hypothesis, and the hypothesis goes down that parasites in red blood cells with increased mass will increase erythrocytes agglutination, and recesses are formed with non parasitized red blood cells or with platelets. They are both meaning the occurrence here will lead to impaired perfusion and hypoxia with decreased oxygen and glucose supply to the brain, which will lead to coma. Still on the pathos, chysogony leads to the release of antigens, which in turn will lead to the release of cytokines and chemokines. Other factors will be endothelial injury, apoptosis, blood brain barrier dysfunction, and intracranial hypertension. The pathway will also continue as part of seizures. So why do we have seizures here in cerebral malaria? Plasmodium falciparum on its own is a pleptogenic, and D 
this will likely occur in children. You may use phenobarbital, which will be helpful, but if you give high dose for treatment of prophylaxis, that can kill the children, okay? Well, to summarize the pato in cerebral malaria, the culprits will be parasitized red blood cells that are sequestered in cerebral microvasculature. Also, local endothelial injury and apoptosis will develop. Inflammation will set in. And then there will be blood brain barrier dysfunction. There will be brain swelling and intracranial hypertension will occur. Sequestration will be leading to a positive brain injury. Multiple mechanisms are involved. If you want to have the neuroimaging, the best will be magnetic resonance imaging. The pathogenesis is still poorly known. Now, clinical features of cerebral malaria. They have become and the coma will be for at least one hour after termination of scissors or after we must have adequately corrected hypoglycemia, if at all. Also, presence of essential forms of plasmodium falciparum on peripheral blood smear is expected. Other causes of coma must have been ruled out already may not be able to rule out other confounding factors. Loss of consciousness is the peak of the cerebral malaria, and then later, the loss of consciousness will degenerate to coma. One to three days of fever in African children and then scissors may be paid, and the child becomes weak, and then he or she will lose consciousness and finally degenerate to coma with or without death. Other signs and symptoms that we can pick in cerebral malaria that may not be specific will include headache, fever, body ache, delirium, pulmonary edema, anemia, hemoglobinuria, jaundice, shock, renal failure, or respiratory distress. All this could be picked in any severe malaria condition. So adults that will have cerebral malaria will have some other you know, signs and symptoms like cortical infarcts, dura sinus thrombosis, cerebral venous thrombosis. So in this age group, in the adults, when cerebral malaria is suspected, please let's have you know, neuroimaging done. MRI, CT. Late deaths will be due to bacterial superimposed infection and shock. Some kids will have language disorder, post cerebral malaria. Some will develop epilepsy. Cerebral malaria treated scissors is going to be febrile scissors with generalized tonic cloning and secondary generalized scissors. In cerebral malaria, there might be behavioral changes with inattention, impulsiveness, and hyperactivity. So, that is pointing to what? Can somebody give me that? Mm -hmm. Attention deficit and hyperactive disorder. Okay, great. Conduct disorder, impaired social disorders, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Post treatment neuro problems in cerebral malaria will include neuro deficits, cognitive deficits, behavioral difficulties, and epilepsy. Okay, now to cap it as far as cerebral malaria for now, our other pieces of info on cerebral malaria could be found through this link. There is a separate full presentation on cerebral malaria by me already published. Please kindly click on this very link and you have details as far as cerebral malaria. Now, HIV and malaria. If you want full details from the beginning, you can click on this very link. I have a separate and full presentation 
on HIV and malaria combined in an individual already published right here. This link will give us full deep you now full info. But I'll not just you know, skip without letting you have some pieces of info right now. Okay, someone is having both HIV and malaria combined. This must be established that you are not double dosing any medication in them because there are certain medications that could go for both or that is used you know, for prophylaxis in HIV that could be used to treat malaria or prophylaxis or used in malaria that is helpful in HIV. So you must go through all the medications that he or she is taking before prescribing the one you want to prescribe today. Either you want to treat the HIV today or the malaria or prophylaxis in HIV or prophylaxis in malaria. You must go through all the lists. If not, you might be double dosing some. Okay, certain medications should be watched here. Certain medications that we must pay attention to in anyone with comorbidities of HIV and malaria will be parametamine. Cotrimazole, that is your Bactrim, Septra, or Septrin, Evavirence. If he or she is on Evavirence, please no attestinate Amodiaquine right now. No. If he or she is on Zidovudine for HIV, Evavirence is for HIV, Zidovudine is for HIV, then no attestinate Amodiaquine for malaria, please. Attestinated sovadosine pyrimetamine should be washed. Epidemiology. Both diseases, that is HIV and malaria, are among the topmost health problems affecting the developing countries. Malaria is a major problem in Africa, with many cases in Asia and Latin America. The two interact synergistically and bidirectionally, meaning when anyone has both, then the effect is going to be greater than what each may likely cause in the person. And one, the presence of one, will help the other disease to prevail. Severity of malaria increases with the presence of HIV and vice versa. HIV and malaria combined is killing pregnant women and children less than five years in developing countries. It's a mean immune individuals against malaria should become HIV positive, then a full-blown malaria is likely. HIV and malaria pato. Malaria is associated with a strong CD4 cell activation and of regulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Thus, it is going to be creating the environment for the growth of HIV virus among CD4 cells and consequently having a very rapid HIV-1 replication. Higher risk for clinical malaria is going to be the case when we have both. The lower the immunity, the worse the outcome with malaria. More treatment failures will be occurring here. HIV viral load may likely increase. Highly effective drugs will be needed for the two conditions. Malaria can cause anemia. Pregnancy on its own can cause anemia. HIV and highly active antiviral therapy can lead to anemia. Now imagine a scenario. A pregnant woman with HIV and malaria, what would the level of hemoglobin be? Hmm. Will she have or how severe will the anemia likely be? Let me repeat this. Imagine malaria can cause anemia, pregnancy can cause anemia, HIV can cause anemia, the medication can cause anemia. Now, a pregnant woman with HIV and malaria, how severe would that anemia level B. Treatment. Based on the ongoing HIV treatment, certain anti-malaria should be avoided. 
If on a variance, no attestinate Amodia Queen. If on Zidovudin, no attestinate Amodia Queen. You may give attestinates of a dozen pyrimetomy, but don't give attestinates of a dozen pyrimetomy if on pyrimetomy or cotimosa so. No, as provalences due to that HIV against pneumocystic gyrovesic pneumonia, formerly known as pneumocystic carinia pneumonia. Okay, I hope this is clear. Involve your pharmacist and clinical pharmacologist when it comes to handling HIV and malaria and going through the list of medications being taken you know, for malaria or for HIV. Prevention. Prevention, they say, is cheaper than cure. That is, if the situation is even curable at all. You can use pyrimetamine containing you no know, meds, but don't double dose. Okay? Because you can find this in HIV patients. You can also find this in you know, anyone trying to prevent malaria or even treating malaria because fancy that contains it, right? Cortimosazole is okay, but must not you know, be double dosing. Okay, you can use cortimosazole, that's Bactrim, Septra, or Septrain, to deal with the malaria, and some use it you know, in HIV for prophylaxis as well. The list of anti malaria agents. I've gone through the entire list of the available anti-malaria with the use of a member as an example. The entire presentation is right here. So you may just click on this and get details of the list of anti-malaria right here. Now, I'll quickly go through some of them. At the program now, the link is right here. So there you get details. That is malarone. Very, very helpful for prophylaxis, particularly people traveling from the Western world to the malaria endemic zones of the world. Advacom program Neil could come under many different brand names. Malarone, Malarone Pediatric, Malarone Junior, Antonin, Rumbado, Promozio, Oristo. Atuvacon proguanil uses, mostly for prophylaxis against malaria, and treatment of uncomplicated malaria, treatment of a severe malaria only after you have used your intravenous anti-malaria agent. Atuvacon proguanil has some other facts, but because I don't want to weary you with a too long presentation, you can find the mechanism of action, the side effects, the dosing, contraindications, warnings, drug drug interaction, monitoring the pregnancy, if you click on this very link. Now, so adosine pyrimetomy. That is under the brand name Fancy Do, right? Please, for details, you can click on this very link. So Adosin Pyrimetomy could be under different brand names, like Fancida, Amala, Coridosin FM, Domin, Doridos, Fancida, Plasmodin, and Remodel. This is an anti-malaria agent. The Pyrimetomy is anti-protozoa, while Adosin is a sulfonamide. So someone that is sensitive to sulfonamide should not take Fancida. Fancida is pretty helpful in HIV as prophylaxis against hemocystic gyrovesic pneumonia and that may not be the first you know, choice for that purpose but when what you want to make do with is not available you make do with what is available. Short-term prophylaxis against malaria, you can use it. You may use it for the treatment of uncomplicated chloroquine resistant malaria. In the absence of other suitable drugs, it can be used for prophylaxis against PJP 
they shall be patient. If you want to know more about sovadosin and pyrimetomy as per mechanism of action, side effects, dosing, conindications, warning, drug drug interaction, monitoring, and pregnancy, please kindly click on this very link. As a method of infantry, combination medication, right? Atimenta will increase by three times as per absorption, and lumefantrin will increase by 16 times as per absorption when taken with fat meal. So, it is fair to say that we can advise the patient to take atimenta lumefantrin with a fat meal. Okay, also, in women of childbearing age, and he or she is planning to have contraception, no hormonal contraception while on atimetalum infantry. And why that? This combination can reduce the effectiveness of the hormonal contraceptives. What are we going to do? Another type of contraception entirely. For all other pieces of info like mechanism of action, drug drug interaction, side effects, and so on, as per atimetalum infantry, please kindly click on this very link. I have Four pieces of info on that. Now, attestinate Amodia Queen. Remember the possibility of fatal hepatitis and that this medication is not used for prophylaxis. Also, in HIV malaria positive patients, I mean, someone with the comorbidities. We can now use a testonate amodia queen if the individual is also on zero vudin of a variance for HIV. Please, for full info on a testonate amodia queen, for you no know, from mechanism of action till drug drug interaction monitoring and everything, kindly click on this very link. Mefloquine. This medication was very popular in those days and still now being useful in many parts of the world and military officials in those days were unnamed for prophylaxis from western world to malaria endemic zones but we must be pretty careful about neuropsychiatric complications and that will call for extreme caution don't use it in individuals with neuropsychiatric disorders, seizures, and some psychiatric conditions. Well, you'll get full pieces of info right there. You can click on this link to get the pieces of info on Mephlocoin. Pyramas, yeah. This is combination of pyronaridine and atacinate. One combination with the capability of doing great job against Ebola, COVID-19, the still undergoing trial right now as I speak, against plasmodium, particularly plasmodium falciparum multidrug resistant malaria, against trypanosomiasis, pervesiosis, and the pyroniridine component also has anti-tumor activity. This drug, will become one of the greatest drugs on earth when all these trials being supported by Bill and Melinda Gates are all true and approved by World Health Organization. Already approved by European Union for the treatment of malaria since 2015. Spread the news that there is a great drug, Pyramus, that is in the making. For details on Pyramas, please kindly click on this very link. You'll get further pieces of info on that. Atacinate. No. Oh, there we go. Atacinate is now the number one agent, intravenous agent, for the treatment of severe malaria. I will not waste your time. I will soon get into the use of atacinate in a bit, even here. But for the pieces of info, details as per atacinate could be found through this very link. Please click on this and get more on atacinate.
A tersonate is not you know, being used as a sole agent to treat malaria, but as a tersonate combination therapy, e.g. a tersonate amodiaquine, a tersonate pyronaridine called pyramus. Primaquine. Primaquine is a single drug with great effect for radical cure. That is to wipe off the hepatic schism, preventing relapse, and clear the liver completely. So you are moving, relocating, you no know, coming into the Western world from endemic zones, I mean from malaria endemic zones, particularly plasmodium uh, oval and beavers. Please grab your prima queen because your erythrocytic stage is the only one that will be cleared with your regular anti-malaria agent that will end your signs and symptoms. The hepatic stage will still be intact. So click on this link for further details. Medications for severe malaria. This will be broadly divided into quinine and quinidine, atimata and attention. Africans are more sensitive to quinine than Asians, meaning if you don't have a testonate and you need to give quinine, if you are faced with that situation in an individual that is an African patient, that is okay, but you just have to be careful with the side effects. But for the Asian patient, and you don't have your testonate, then you have to go for atimata, and if you can, then you still give the quinine. Intramuscular atimata is erratically absorbed. A testonate supercitary capsules are okay if you are in a remote part of the world, and what is available is a testonate supercitary. Please grab it and use it because the capsules are well absorbed. This property makes a testonate supercitary to be more suitable for the treatment of moderately severe malaria in remote places of the world. Quinine adochloride could be given intravenously, but that should be given very, very slowly. We don't rush it, right? Also available is quinidine gluconin. I'll talk more about that later because in US, you will not find quinine, but you will find quinidine gluconin. Quinine could be given intramuscularly at the rate of 20 mg per kilogram DIM to anterior tie. Let me explain. When you calculate your total dose as per 20 mg per kilogram, then you divide into two. You give half of the total to the anterior tie of the patient on the left, and the second half on the right, anterior tie. You can also give quinine, you no know, supercitary or quinine by rectal root. So you can give quinine intravenously, intramuscularly, and by rectal. Quinine has a narrow therapeutic index. It will not be good to give quinine rapidly intravenously. Why that? It's going to lead to toxicity. And the toxicity here will include prolonged QT. Now, let's rattle through this. When there is prolonged QT, that could degenerate to Tuzar the pond. So that the point could degenerate to monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia monomorphic could degenerate to ventricular tachycardia that is polymorphic. And the polymorphic ventricular tachycardia could degenerate to ventricular fibrillation. If there is no defibrillation, ventricular fibrillation could degenerate to asystole. And in the absence of 
advanced cadre life support, you know, being treated so quickly, calling code blue if it is hospital or calling 911 if it's on the field, then the patient may end up in the morgue, that is death. And of course, a read me. Blindness, you know, imagine from trying to help these fellow human beings to making their situation worse, I pray that will seek help above. Could lead to coma and could lead to death. Synchronism is a possibility with quinine and that could lead to hearing loss or deafness, nausea and vomiting, denied us, flushing, dizziness, blood vision or blindness. Synchronism can be from any of the quinine derivatives like tonic water, quinidine, chloroquine, and hydroxychloroquine. As a matter of fact, you can check my channel here for full presentation on hydroxychloroquine and also from quinine sulfate. Severe apoglycemia is a major problem when you use quinine. Whether hyperinsulinemia can occur with quinine, leading to severe hypoglycemia, and the patient may die from that. There may be allergy with rashes. Edema can occur even with small dose, and it can paralyze the attic nerve, the reason for using the anterior tie. Quinine could be given TID and can be given by both intravenous and intramuscular route. Intravenous is given slowly, while intramuscular is deep intramuscular to the anterior tie. Resistance against quinine is now found in Southeast Asia. So, my friends in Southeast Asia have less problem dealing with quinine and the side effects like chinconism, severe apoglycemia, hypertension, and so on, including blindness, because resistance is already built, so they will likely run away from quinine, right? It is not the first drug of choice in many parts of the world anymore. You know? If Atesonate is not available and you are dealing with severe malaria, you can still take the risk of you know, using quinine. Quinidine. Quinidine is the only one used in USA. They don't use quinine in USA. It is not so proper for malaria, but it is used for severe malaria treatment. It is similar to quinine in action and side effects, but it is more horrible than quinine because of more cardiotoxicity. We don't use other medications that can prolong QT when anyone is on quinine or quinidine. And other medication that could prolong QT will be quinine, mefloquine, erythromycin, antipsychotics, atemeta, and the list goes on. In conclusion, the world without malaria is feasible, meaning we can get it, we can get it done. Why that? There are so many experimental drugs right now. When you know, the experiments are all done and some of them are approved for use, then the situation will change for better. Also, we've gone through the vaccine. And I've also left you know, a link for further details on malaria vaccine. Since 1960, it has been back and forth. Now, with the help of some P pharmaceutical companies and Bill and Gates, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates, vaccine is really undergoing a serious trial. So malaria vaccine is under watch by World Health Organization right now. The pilot program is ongoing, and that will wrap up in 2023. Prevention is cheaper than control. That is, if the station is even controllable at all. 
We can prevent malaria. You can click on the control of malaria again and listen to everything we can do to you know, put malaria under control. And what other organization is interested in that also, and they are also encouraging. Appropriate drugs should be taken or should be prescribed by the doctor and the patient should make sure that there's compliance. Whether if that is done, if erythrocytic stage is taken care of appropriately using the appropriate you know, medication and the hepatitis chasms are also eradicated, then even when female anovelis mosquito you no know, bites, will only suck blood without you know, the plasmodium. And when you relocate from endemic zone to the non-endemic zone, you will not come down with malaria you know, several months after. Government policies. Yes, no group can do this job alone. Malaria is found in many countries, up to 90 countries around the world. So government policies should help in focusing on prevention, control, and appropriate you know, medications. Let ministers of health in all the countries that are battling with malaria endemicity to inform and involve the government that are, you know, will be involved in policy making in their respective jurisdictions. Why that? Let you know, standardized drugs that are good and strong, like atestinate intravenous for severe malaria, be available. Let primaquin be available to wipe off the hepatitis chasm if it is plasmodium oval or vivus. Let primas be available to eradicate plasmodium falciparum multidrug resistance. Let's get you know all those things in order, and of course control measures. You no, know, some laws can be enacted to force everyone to cut grass, to you know do away with stagnant water around their buildings. Human willingness will help, even when government is not making policies to do that. We can make up our mind that we don't want to. Let malaria continue once more. Listening to this man, our presentation will help also to know how to embark on preventive measures and control measures. Medical science will not cease. Like what we are doing right now, going through this presentation to see that the knowledge is being impacted. And in fact, to some who have the knowledge, there is a kind of revision right now, and this should not cease. I will not stop you know, researching more and more and bringing out whatever is new you know, in this field to human race. And with that, I will end with some quotes from my friends from South Korea. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts, Koreans will say. And also, Koreans will say that coming together is a beginning. So coming together, you know, government agents, everyone you know, showing willingness, and medical science not stopping, continue with all these trials and testing and experiments that are ongoing, will be keeping us together that will make us to be progressive. And working together will grant us that required sources of malaria eradication. And finally, I'll borrow the language from South Korea again to say, Gam Shahan Nida. I don't know if I pronounce it very well. Can you forgive me, my friends from South Korea? Many, thank you. Please remember to share this. Remember to subscribe to my channel. Remember to give thumbs up. You are free to leave your comment. I appreciate it.